Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for that obituary. <laughs> um, Minister Mwantli uh, Kungubela, Professor Gravitz and colleagues from UJ, in particular colleagues from the business school, thank you for hosting this event. Um, our honored guests and speakers, thank you for honoring this event. Ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, our students uh, who may be here today. I want to start by thanking you, Minister, for choosing us uh, to locate this uh, important um, endeavor because uh, AI is indeed something that is of concern to all of us. But I want to assure you that uh, at UJ, you have come to the fertile ground because this is what we eat every day. This is what we do every day. Every student uh, at the University of Johannesburg at first year level takes a course on AI so that they can navigate their learning journey intelligently and of course their lives. This is not a cause for people who want to specialize in that field, but this is a cause for people who want to live lives, their lives fully, because we recognize the importance of AI in everyone's life. We also have graduated a significant number of students uh, in the many areas um, that technology is a key component in, and in Africa, we are also a major player in this field. For, for these and so many reasons, this is the right home for this initiative. We are also concerned about um, our impact in society in just about everything we do. Uh, just to give you an example, my day job, uh, kind of like go-go job of a retiree, is teacher training in rural areas. And it is teacher training that is also very much focused on the use of technology for learning and teaching. My activities are mostly in Limpompo, and UJ is there. They have been helping us to train teachers who I'm so proud of because last year in their grade 12 exam, you could see the impact of the teaching that they've received from UJ. So that, again, is impact uh, in society. We have, in the last few years, been hearing about the fourth industrial revolution. It seemed far, complicated, and something that only the highly learned understood. But actually now, it is affecting us. It is part of our life. We embrace it, it excites us, but we're also scared of it. These opportunities um, of learning and understanding it more helps us to embrace it and use it intelligently. So we are excited for our students because they can be pioneer and they can take their learning into communities so that they continue to have impact in society. So thank you so much for choosing us and I hope uh, today will be a successful day and we welcome everybody who is here, and we hope that uh, you will enjoy this day at UG. I must congratulate the business school. I've not been underground for a long time. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that you, you had this man cave uh, under the building, so congratulations for all the work uh, that you do.
Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Mlambo Nguka, and thank you for in, um, welcoming us to the fertile land. I like, I like that saying. Um, we are honored to be here, and we are honored to be welcomed by your, your, yourself. Um, we're going to move over to our next segment, which will be the keynote, but I just wanted to ask before I introduce the minister, um, the colleagues that are going to be in a panel uh, in the next two sessions. Can you please make your way to the back to be marked? Um, these are the colleagues that are part of the hubs um, and the institute. Thank you. So, uh, moving over to another very, very long um, CV. Um, and I've asked the team to, to prepare it for me. Um, and it, it reads as follows as I introduce our honorable minister and um, co-host for today. Minister Gungubele was appointed as the Minister of Communications and Digital Technologies of the Republic of South Africa as of the 6th of March 2023. He previously served as Minister in the Presidency responsible for Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. The National Planning Commission and also Statistics South Africa um, Government Communications and Information, GCIS, and State Security, um, SSA. Minister Gungubele has extensive experience in local, provincial, and national government and actively applies himself in strategic planning and effective monitoring of systems to ensure that government is held accountable to deliver services to the people. He's a political activist at heart, of course, um, who has spent much of his youth fighting for the liberation and just South Africa, which is united in diversity. The minister is passionate, um, is a passionate informal scholar of all things technology. He's dedicated to the advancement thereof um, for the betterment of social and economic um, development in our country. I have had the honor of being in uh, several briefing sessions with the minister and his passion on the subject of um, artificial intelligence, its potential and what we can do as a nation around this has been really commendable. It is my honor to call on stage Minister Gongubele. What do you do after the chancellor? I don't like speaking after you because I don't know what to say. Program director, Helen, the Minister of Com uh, Chancellor, Dr. Pumzile, Deputy President, and many other titles that I can mention, the Premier of Province in Abstentia, His Excellency Ambassadors and High Commissioners, Chairperson of State-Owned Entities and Associations, Director General's Officers and, and Senior Officers, our Host and Dean of the JBS, Prof. Corelson, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mampedi, in his absence, a diligent and an activist in this program. Of course, the acting Vice Chancellor, I call her gravitation. <laughs> Leaders in academia, captains of industries and CEOs, ladies and gentlemen in the house and joining us online, good morning. I thought before I'm formal, just to say a few things. Uh, I'm so emotional about today. This is an inaugural AI summit in South Africa. Because having traveled in a short space of time in this sector, it, be, it has become clear to me that our country has got a lot of potential 
which is not coordinated, which is not properly marshaled, which when coordinated and marshaled, it can turn into something very phenomenal. AI became one of those areas where I realized that we are fractious. And a technology of this nature, which is in the forefront, being fractious is one thing you cannot afford. To me, AI is like a, a child who's running faster than other children. And there's a risk of that child running and disappear. And when the child disappears, it's no longer under the guidance of those who, who, who produce the child. And the dangers of a child who is not in touch with parents, you can imagine. So that's how AI is. So I had a, a privilege in Davos, uh, David President, of being in an environment for an hour with the top experts in this technology. All world top countries were represented, be it America, China, and all of them. The debate was about the pros and cons of AI. It was such an exciting debate. Uh, it was such an, an exciting and inspiring sometimes heartwarming, sometimes. In. So I, I left, I was not the same after that debate. And I knew that when we come home, the biggest challenge we have as government is how we provide leadership. I was saying to the GCO yesterday, having watched her, of SABC, having watched her brilliant interview on SABC, I was saying to her, there are two things I worship, the deepest difference I worship between leadership, great leadership, and great leader. We're saying great leaders are dispensable, but great leadership is indispensable. The challenge we have as government, face by face, is the leadership we leave behind. How does it keep the country on course in a con on continuous basis, irrespective of who is in charge? Because our country cannot afford breakage in terms of generation to generation. We need to move from one generation and do better in the next generation. So AI, is one such thing we had to have our inaugural summit. And I'm very much touched by the responses. I'm overwhelmed when I see the attendance. And I hope to be as unusually short as possible. It is an honor and privilege to address this gathering that marks a significant milestone in our technology advancement as a country. This gathering, ladies and gentlemen, will forge a route that will guide and influence our actions as we lead future generations towards strong global competitiveness using technology to address human needs. Today, the spotlight falls on artificial intelligence. The, the, the chancellor said, what is its impact on people? Because everything we do, the critical question you must answer is so what? So what to a poor person? So what to the state of the country? So what to crime? So what to manufacturing? So what to sovereignty? So what to security? Of the, so what to all those? If these technologies do not answer that question in line with what the chancellor the President said, again, this become another futile exercise. On the 6th to 7th July 2023, the International Telecommunications Union, commonly referred to as ITU, coordinated groundbreaking AI for Good Global Summit in Geneva, Switzerland, to explore the promotion 
of AI, of AI advance, health, climate, gender, inclusive prosperity, sustainable infrastructure, and other global development priorities. Addressing the summit, the Secretary General of the ITU, Ms. Doreen Bogdan Mati, a very, very energetic lady, emphasized the need to prioritize human values and ensure that AI benefits everyone, including 2.7 billion people worldwide who are still offline and are often left behind. She highlighted the importance of meaningful inclusion, stating, open quote, those who are left behind are at the very heart of the sustainable development goals, and they need to be at the heart of how we design AI. Or close quote. The role and potential of AI in assisting the world to get the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal back on track by 2030 is an imperative and a responsibility that every nation of the world must be seized with. Indeed, the era of generative AI is just beginning, and as a country and continent, we cannot and must not allow ourselves to be left behind. The explosion of AI as a greater technology tool has placed a responsibility on all of us to ensure that we realize its maximum innovative potential and make its use safe and ethical for all. In the global arena, South Africa is seen as an exemplary country with bright prospects within the African continent and the global environment. During the 2024 World Economic Forum held in Davos, Switzerland, Remarks were made that prospects of global security and peace has moved from Paris, New York, and Brussels to Pretoria. It is with this appreciation of how the world view us that we believe that South Africa needs to be at the center of advancing the cutting technology. In other words, if we are the reference for human rights, we need to be the reference for leading in this technology because it finds expression in the state of human rights. Program Director, South Africa continues to tackle the social and economic challenges inherent from being such a diverse country. While the challenges may be many and daunting, they are definitely not insurmountable. Pulling the wisdom and expertise of our sector, particularly AI, we are up to the challenge. As a minister, I'm tasked by law through Electronic Communications Act and various universal access legislative prescripts to develop an approach that will ensure the fast adoption of emerging technologies that will set South Africa towards a brighter future. It is for this reason that this summit has been convened for government and the sector to initiate a policy regulatory framework to guide and leverage the advances in AI for human good. Recently, we have seen extraordinary advances in the capabilities of AI through chatbots, voice cloning, image generators, video apps, and much more. The economic benefit of the adoption of AI has been well documented. For example, in a study conducted by the Access Partnership, it is projected that South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya stand to benefit $136 billion on the adoption and use of AI. What we are saying on the harnessing AI to revolutionize our socioeconomic well-being. AI is built on the understanding that machines must, must complement humans. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, commonly referred to as OECD, study indicates that, open quote, we will now live alongside digital technology in the digital technologies in the physical and virtual worlds. These include machines pre-programmed to follow a precise set of rules or that are fully autonomous and can operate without human intervention. They include immersive environments that combine features of physical and virtual worlds to create realistic experiences such as precision farming and surgical training that would be difficult to reproduce in real world setting. Behind these and other innovations in the early phases of implementations are complex mathematical models, 
trained on large computers with vast amounts of data to emulate human-like cognitive function that is artificial intelligence, close quote. What becomes obvious is that public policy making and framework must adapt to address the governance imperative of AI and emerging technologies to protect globally agreed human rights. AI policies are key to building strong digital ecosystem in which governments, business and individuals can reap the benefits. As we carve out a response towards the adoption of artificial intelligence, policy and regulation position within South Africa, there are three main aspects that would, be, that would have to be understood when we endeavor to harness AI. These are a da AI data governance and connectivity to support policymakers in this process. The importance of cooperating internationally to ensure that AI as an emerging technology is trustworthy. And three, common understanding of AI is built through sharing and good practices and creating evidence-based AI system to inform policy design, implementation, and evaluation. So I've again positioned on, on harnessing AI. Program director, for us to remain a relevant trading partner that protects and advances its national interests, we need to be among the rest of the early status in the production and adoption of digital technology solutions to human problems. There are areas that are traditionally the exclusive mandate for governments to conduct its business. Areas such as defense, safety and security, social security net support and intelligence gathering, amongst others, come to my mind. These are areas where government must lead in the adoption of AI. There are, however, other areas where direct role of government is expected through policy formulation and regulatory approaches that will safeguard the preservation of livelihoods and creation of sustainable jobs. In this area, the adoption of AI must ensure the ethical and impactful purpose of delivery. The question related to the theme, open code, harnessing AI, close code, especially from South African perspective, is whether as African continent we can even begin to determine AI regulations. I point this out, ladies and gentlemen, because we all know that there would not be effective regulation without the existence of a clear policy position. The danger of formulating regulations not guided by sound policy is like being asked to comply to a non-existent phenomenon. African, what African Union Ministers of Communication AI declaration has to say, in 2019, AU ministers responsible for communication in ICTs adopted the Sham A. Sheikh Declaration wherein there was an agreement on establishing working group on AI for the following, the creation of common African stance on AI, the development of Africa-wide AI capacity building framework, and the establishment of an AI think tank. As South Africa, through our presidential report on the fourth industrial revolution, we also identified AI as one of the key areas for Africa for our strategy and look forward to collaborating with all of you in our midst. In the, on the United Nations AI approach, on the 26th of October 2023, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres launched the high level multi stakeholder advisory body on artificial intelligence. In addressing the media on the occasion of this launch, he remarked that, open quote, in our challenging times, AI could power extraordinary progress for humanity, for developing economies. AI offers the possibility of leapfrogging outdated technologies and bringing service delivery directly to people where needs are bigger and for the, for the people that need them most, close quote. All these, he concluded, could only be realized if we harness AI responsibly, making it accessible to all, thereby reducing global inequalities. The world appreciates the risk associated with the adoption of AI. These risks include misinformation, disinformation, and entrenching of bias and discrimination, surveillance and invasion of privacy, fraud and other violations of human rights. 
in order to prevent the malicious use of this technology, the UN has established entity, entities wrestling with big questions about how to harness AI to help humanity positively. It offers us a glimpse of real progress towards achieving the SDGs. What is Africa's notable initi initiative on AI? I have noted that there are various AI initiatives on African continents. Some of the examples are the AI in Africa Machine Learning in Daba, conducted by South Africa, the Alliance of AI led by Africans in the diaspora, initiatives by major global companies seeking collaboration on the continent, for example, Google, which has established an, an AI center in Ghana, the release of the Africa AI blueprint by Smart Africa Alliance through the chairpersons of South Africa. Thank you. South, South African government's endeavor to establish the Artificial Intelligence Institute and Center of Artificial Intelligence Research. I thought this was cool. Uh, noting this, I therefore impress upon cloud companies such as Microsoft, Google, Huawei, Nokia, and Amazon Web Services, amongst others, to continue establishing AI research centers in Africa. The biggest challenge, before I proceed on this point, is that I had very touchy and uh, emotional discussions with Professor Marvet young and amazing South African talent. Uh, we wanted to, uh, he, he was actually enlightening me why so many people who are developed in this digital technology leave South Africa. And uh, he says to me, they've got no work to do here. I find that the um, Deputy Minister to be indicting. How do we produce people who we don't know how we want to use. That's a huge challenge. As a result, they are taken all over the world, by Europe, America, and everywhere else. Trump calls us that thing which he calls us, but he does not know what he is celebrating is at the expense of the technology that we export to him. He doesn't know because he's a blinkered right winger. So we should avoid that. We can't produce. Professor Morello was saying about two months ago, he says, under me, he either said, I produced 39 doctorates or masters. He says, Mesa, where are they? This is the biggest question you must answer. Where I work, I won't tell you the department because it's a sensitive department. It's a sensitive department. It sent people in Korea, trained them in this technology. Young people, well trained. When they came home, because we in government didn't have work for them, private sector took them. So this is a major question, a takeaway, Deputy Minister. My DG is not here. She is doing another job. I'm sure those who watched me on interview yesterday, it was post office. She is spending 24 hours out of her bed to find how can we reduce that 4,700 that is being retrenched. She couldn't come here. She had to cancel this meeting and replace with that. I don't want to see her because I know the stress she is going through. But if she was here, I was going to say the same thing to her. This is the huge question you must answer. When I was a mayor in Eguruleni, I led something called Eretropolis, airport economy. Our ambitions, we kept on finding Eguruleni children in Midrand, in Tswane, in Kripta. We asked the president, why are these children here not in Eguruleni? We realized that they had no dream to live for in Eguruleni. That's how we realized the power of the airport economy. And when we started that, it ignited. You can see the corridor around Alaton Duan, business community and everything. A number of kids of Egrulen 
Now, when they grow, they see the dream for which to live is in Agurulem. Now, our children, as they go through school, as you say, first year, all of them go via AI. They must be inspired by how are they going to use that in their own country. So this is a huge question here. I thought I must pause here. <laughs> Secondly, we need universities in South Africa and Africa to consider that the best approach to AI is collaboration. As the Department of Communication and Digital Technologies in the Republic of South Africa, we've adopted an all-inclusive approach which is at the heart of our shared response to addressing the digital transformation era. For Africa to battled and scrapped and got their way to a final. There was a space race, then the arms race, and now there's an AI race. We cannot afford to be left behind that way. You see, in the mechanical era, Britain laws that prescribed what we do with our raw materials. Sometimes people think that this is conspiracy. Those laws, you can excavate and find them. There's no, there's no worse genocide than making sure that a country doesn't manufacture. Because when a country doesn't manufacture, and in, in, in an environment of new technologies is decimated. If you say they must not manufacture, you say there must be no new technologies in that country. Because how do you develop new technologies if you are not dealing with new ideas and solutions in that? So that's what Britain did to us. But I don't have amount of money to to evaluate what damage that cause, because I'm not, I'm not an accountant. The onus is upon us to participate in this AI race through a coordinated and collaborative approach. We require venture capital funds that are focused on and dedicated to artificial intelligence. We, 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 we need the world to assist us in this, but as we take initiative, and we take responsibility for our own future. In other words, whether it's Britain, whether it's America, whether it's China, those who come to assist us, the mission must be determined by us. Lastly, we need to realize collaboration between government and private sector in AR research. In November 2022, the Artificial Intelligence Institute of South Africa was formed and it has since been established, it has since, it is, it has since established applied AI hubs with key stakeholders such as academia, private sector, investors, and civil society. There are several South African starts, there are several South African startups such as Zinoe, which focuses on simplifying AI and machine learning. They possess distinctive algorithms like Amazon.com and Netflix wherein they determine user behavior and predict potential purchasing behavior. We also have startups known as Clever, Clever but not in the normal Clever, right? Clever, C-L-E-V-V-A, a technology business that specializes in the art and science of AI for people. In Nairobi, Kenya, Strathmore University established the Ed Lab Africa Research Center that sought to promote cutting edge research in AI among other emerging technologies. In Nigeria, the University of Lagos recently opened an AI hub that will focus on deep learning and tools to collect data for AI purposes. In essence, the core economic sectors that have been the bedrock of the African continent are identified as the ones to largely benefit from AI. Economic sectors such as agriculture, mining, art, etc., are identified to become efficient, high quality, and providing expansions in benefits. Program Director, Artificial Intelligence Institute of South Africa has started to focus on ensuring the key economic sectors are first to leverage AI capabilities. We launched the first AI hub here, UJ, focusing on manufacturing 
because of the size of his contribution to GDP, which is now close to 14%, far low than the historic ratio as we know it. When, the, when, when the, we then launched the second AI hub in TUT, focusing mainly on automotive sector because of the vastness of the vehicle production and assembling in South Africa, we are also launching the CUT AI hub focused on agriculture and farming as a notable sector. Before the end of May, we plan to launch the AI hub focused on defense and military capabilities at our military academy, Saldana, west coast of Western Cape. In total, we would like to, part to capacitate AI Institute of South Africa with at least 11 AI hubs ranging from built environment, just energy transition, health, media, and language, etc. The ITU call for the AI for good approach that still must be adopted by the member states. I therefore encourage all the African countries to work in unison to adopt the recommendation of the AI for good principles which encourage for a trusted, safe, and inclusive development of AI technology and equitable access. The G2019, which was under the presidency of Japan, put in place the importance of AI within their midst for addressing their economic challenges. These notable approaches prompted our president, His Excellency Mr. Matamela Cyril Ramaphosa at the African Union Summit of 2020 to call for a unified African regional AI stance, which will serve as a blueprint to guide the African membership states in their developing policies and, re and, re and, re and regulation related to AI as technology tool for good. As a result, South Africa, in collaboration with Smart Africa Alliance and other member states, supported a diverse stakeholder drafted an AI blueprint roadmap, which will be tabled at the AU soon. We hope that with such a blueprint, our continent's endeavors to be a global authority will be realized. To institutionalize open AI, explicit regulation related to the following five important considerations must be put in place in relation to the development of continental and national AI policies and programs, which are as follows. Data-centric approach linked to the development agenda, people before technology as a center, AI for economic growth, multi-stakeholder approach centered on PPP model, governance and regulatory AI framework, and institutional mechanism located within. As I move towards conclusion, yo, I wanted to. <laughs> <coughs> we must, as a continent, recognize that increased availability of digitized data in the global economy, unlimited access to computing power and lower data storage costs are important in driving the growth of AI globally. I am happy to announce that an AI expert advisory council will be, will be appointed and it will comprise of a group of eminent persons that will guide us towards the implementation and advancement of AI policy and regulation amongst others in our country. To this effect, I have appointed a brilliant young man in Professor Vukos Marivet. I thought Marivet is English. And I was told yesterday is Vanda. <laughs> I could, oh, Marivad. Oh, it's not Marivet. Oh, it's Marivad. <laughs> Thank you very much. To this I have appointed a brilliant young man in Professor Hugos Maribad to head an AI task force together with the department to recommend to me names of appropriate AI experts suitable for appointment to the AI Expert Advisory Council, which I will announce as soon as possible. In conclusion, my expectation is that after today's session, we'll have a clear way forward towards leveraging this cutting edge technology to resolve some of South Africa's economic and social challenges. I also expect that there will be provincial seminars undertaken to further seek inputs during the public comments process before we finalize the draft national AI policy as a guiding and policy document. One anxiety, Ali, I'm worried about before we make that move, 
we must make sure that all the other relevant units in government, your DSI and everyone else, we are one. Because we don't want to go there in those processes, say DSI was here, now you are coming here. That integration as a risk must be mitigated. Thank you for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, um, for that keynote. Um, we look forward to the work that the Advisory Council will be doing in this regard, and I believe that in a short while we'll be delving a bit more into the AI hubs and the artificial intelligence um, um, team. I wanted to just make a quick note, colleagues, regarding the temperature in the room. Um, I know it is a bit humid. Uh, we do apologize for that. Once we take a break, we're going to run um, those fans to cool down the room. It's just that they are extremely loud if we switch them on right now, so we do apologize for that. Uh, moving right along to our next speaker, which is um, the CEO of Microsoft South Africa, Mr. Kalani Rambai, who is our leader and has been really leading in the new era of AI, as we call it, at, at Microsoft. Uh, please help me in putting your hands together for Mr. Kalani. Honorable Minister, Honorable Deputy Minister, Madam Vice-Chancellor, uh, the Acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor, all important guests today, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to also share some few thoughts on the artificial intelligence topic, which is very, very important to all of us today. I think for me, what is really exciting about this new era, as Helen said, we call it at Microsoft, is really the potential minister that it brings to the prosperity of Africa. It is estimated that the GDP of the world will increase by 15 trillion US dollars. If Africa were to capture just 10%, there's 1.5 trillion dollars for Africa. And we can all imagine what we can do with 1.5 trillion dollars in solving all the most complex problems that we face as the continent. The potential for AI to also help us to solve some of the pressing human problems that we've probably deferred in the past is really what is exciting. And I think the, the VC, the acting VC spoke about it, the chancellor spoke about it, the minister spoke about it. Across all sectors you know, of human endeavor, AI can really play an exciting role in helping us to solve these particular problems. It is really a game a game changer. But we also know that the world, as it rapidly changes, Minister used, used the analogy of the child and say the child is running faster, you know, than other kids. We do not expect that the pace will slow down. The pace will continue to accelerate. I think it is very important for us to start thinking as governments, as society, how do we enable that we are not left behind? How do we ensure that we can run as fast as the other children, if I use you know, your own analogy, Minister? The impact is very real on what AI can really can achieve. And I've spoken about the economy. But let us bring it home and look at some of the few examples that we have seen in South Africa, where government particularly has been using AI to solve some of the most pressing issues. I think we all can agree that we are a water scarce country and to see metros like Etequini using AI to curb water wastage, we should be applauding that. The power of AI is its ability to go through vast amounts of data very quickly and be able to pinpoint the insights that ordinarily as humans we may be able to miss. You look at what SARS uh, put in the media, I think it's about two months ago, where they said they've been able to use AI to collect 210 billion rand more for the fiscus. Now, all of you here, 
if you were doubtful about your tax status, I would encourage you to really look at it because SARS is really using this technology for good because we do need to do what is right when we pay our taxes. Uh, the, vice, the Chancellor spoke also about agriculture and the Minister also spoke about agriculture. It's good to see what data, what the data for farmers is doing in terms of enabling South African farmers to analyze the weather patterns to be able to plan with precision their irrigation, their planting, and all of those things. And therefore, really improving their production, which is good for our food security as a country. The Legal Interact is a very exciting one. This is a company that is playing in the digital legal space. And last year, August, they introduced their AI tool which is helping the victims of gender-based violence to be able to put a compelling case before they go to the police. Most of them lose their case because at that point of vulnerability, they don't know what evidence they need to, you know, to keep. And I think we all agree in a country we do have that scourge of GBV to see you know, legal interact, being able to do that, it is really to be applauded. And it is really to the point that we said AI gives us the opportunity to be able to address those pressing issues that perhaps in the past we were not able to get to. Get to. We also know that the new era of AI is not really you know, uh, based on something that is new. AI has been around in different, you know, in various forms. You know, from the 1950s with the Alan Turing test, to the 1959 of Arthur Samuel's machine learning to deep learning, and today when we talk about the generative AI. But the true game changer for generative AI is its ability to put this technology in ordinary people's hands. You don't need to be an expert to be able to use the technology to derive the benefits from the technology. And that is truly the game changer. And what we like also, what we have seen uh, Honorable Minister, there is an NPO in South Africa called Lelapa AI. What Lelapa AI is doing is training our large language models, you know, in our own South African languages. So that means that ordinary South Africans will be able to interact with this technology using natural language, but most importantly, their own mother tongue. So thereby empowering everyone, you know, in our society. So that is really exciting, and we will continue to see progress being made into that. The adoption of this AI technology has also been phenomenal. I'm sure all of you have seen the graph that looks at the adoption in its early days compared to the adoption of other technologies. So it means that the child minister is running fast. So somebody asked me, one of the executives asked me, how do they begin as corporates to adopt? I said, the problem that you are dealing with is that your employees have already adopted. When government says, we're still going to do this, we're still going to do this, and by 2028 we will achieve this, that would have passed you by. The child would have already moved. So it is important that we appreciate the rapid speed that we need to move with before the child actually dictates to everybody what needs to be, what needs to be done. For me, the, when you talk corporates about AI, you talk about how do you revolutionize productivity. And what we have seen from their own employees through various surveys is that they have been very quick in adopting this technology. And because they have seen what it can do for them as employees in terms of giving them back you know, some time. At Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. This has been a mission since the founding days of the company, you know, from the early days where they spoke about putting a, a personal computer in every house. We want to see the adoption of AI being at scale. Last year, generative AI was about, you know, the breakthrough of it. This year, Minister, it's about the adoption of this technology. But it is very important that we do not leave anyone behind. AI is here to augment human capability, not to replace it. It is about ensuring that we leave no one behind. And as the African idiom always says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you walk with others. 
it is important that in this new era we ensure that we walk together and you spoke a lot about partnerships and partnerships are indeed very important for us to ensure that we walk fast we walk far not often but this time around we may have to do both we have to walk fast and walk far all together at the same at the same time because the opportunity for ai cut across everything that we do we spoke about academia you know we can think about what it can do you know for the way that we teach today we can think about how it can improve the healthcare that we provide you know to our most vulnerable people for me it is also about empowering the rural communities with enabling technologies while respecting their cultures traditions and ways of life it is not about changing people it is not about replacing people it is about changing people's lives it is about empowering everyone PwC a couple of years prior to our scoopers issued a study about the paradox of leadership and in there they identified six paradox of leadership there's one that particularly talks to this era that we find ourselves in and it talks to the tech savvy humanist a tech savvy humanist and they say the paradox lies in that those with technical skills do not automatically have the necessary skills to understand or guide the people's human needs and those responsible for people do not always realize the impact that technology has on the organization and people the essence therefore of a leader who is a tech savvy humanist is to anchor the success of the organization on marrying the two in so doing offering a better future for their people the same applies to running a country the same applies to leading a nation we need to be tech savvy humanist that means finding a balance between technically savvy with a focus on the people therefore for us at microsoft ai transformation puts humanity at the center solving the most complex problem humanity face today whether it's healthcare education safety and security food production but at the end of the day it is not about the technology for what technology is it is about transforming the lives of people with enabling technology and like i said we have seen already that most people are adopting the technology you know according to the work trend survey 75% of the employees that they surveyed had already started using technology before even the organizations had adopted the technology and because they saw opportunity in improving their daily lives by being able to delegate administrative tasks to this technology we all sit in meetings the whole day nobody wants to really sit in a meeting and take notes what ai enables you to do is to be able to leave the note taking and action planning to the technology so that you can apply your time to listening to others and being able to push across your point it is about helping them on the analytical thinking like i said the ability of this technology to go through vast amounts of data at the speed of light to be able to help them to be able to get to the outcome that they want the most important one is also about unleashing the creativity and their innovation because ai is giving them time back they need to use the time to be able to use their creative skills in coming up with innovative ideas for the organization a couple of weeks ago i was talking at a microsoft event what we call microsoft envision which is helping business leaders to envision what this technology can do for them and i said to them the one critical thing that they need to think about is how do they cultivate the culture of innovation in the organization because we know this technology is going to improve productivity and give people back some time you want them to use that time for creativity but that means you need to create a platform and a culture that enables them to do that and i said to minister uh, if you don't do that you might find them using the time to play solitaire on the uh, on their machine and then i realized that okay maybe i've given away some of my age in doing that because nobody knows today what solitaire is as a game i for one have seen the benefits of artificial generative artificial intelligence in my own daily experience as any business leader here would attest there's a vast amount of correspondence that you need to deal with on an everyday basis you don't have the time to go through all of that 
the ability for me to use this generative technology every day to summarize all the emails, all the letters, all the chats that I've received to be able to pinpoint which ones I want to focus on has been really tremendous for me. At Microsoft, we call the technology co-pilot, if you want to buy it, by the way. It's M365 co-pilot. And I've got a couple of my guys here, they can help you uh, with how you can purchase that. But it will change your life. It has changed mine, certainly. But in talking about AI, as the previous speakers also said, it's important that we adopt the technology very responsibly. And to us at Microsoft, this is also very, very critical to ensure that whatever the products that we develop, we do so responsibly, but how we adopt and how we implement it for our clients, it is also done very responsibly. We do know in our country, there are some few basics that we still need to get right. And others relate to the infrastructure that will enable that all of us as a nation, we have access to this and there's work that we still need to do with regard to internet connectivity, particularly for the rural areas. But as the minister said, this is the problem that cannot be left to government or industry. It requires a partnership to ensure that we can roll it out. The second piece that is very fundamental is also about digital literacy. How do we skill up as many people as possible to be able to use these digital technologies? Minister, you will be glad to hear that last year's Microsoft we introduced with YES the skilling program for 300,000 youth in South Africa on artificial intelligence, from basic, intermediate, to advanced. And we will continue to roll out such programs. I'm also very proud, Chancellor, I don't know if you know about it, to be at UJ today, because we have worked with UJ to introduce a postgraduate program on artificial intelligence, and they were the first university to take up that opportunity for collaboration. And we continue to talk to other universities about that. And this is a program that is not just sponsored by money by Microsoft. This is us putting our own expertise in crafting that curriculum with the university. Because like I said, our mission is to empower everyone on this planet and ensure no one is left, is left behind. But being able to implement this responsible AI responsibly requires that there should be some guiding principles. And at Microsoft, we've got those six principles that are on your screen that guide us when we talk about AI. And I was very proud when I read the, the discussion paper for AI, you know, for the government. These six principles are there. I think they're on page 39, if I remember well, <laughs> Minister. I couldn't miss, I couldn't miss that. Because for me, it was an attestation that we are on the right track as an organization. But to be able to ensure that these, you know, are implemented at scale, there are four things at Microsoft that we focus on. And the first one is governance, ensuring that there's proper governance around the procurement, the use, you know, and the development of this technology. It is about standardizing the AI requirements so that for those that are going to rely on a platform to build their own systems, we all build from the same standard requirements. It is about training people, as I've said, but most importantly about sharing best practice to ensure that we scale. We don't only leave it to a few players to take this technology forward. And the last one is about ensuring that we give you the tools that will help you to scale this very quickly. I'd just like to play a short video that really articulates how important you know, responsible AI is to us at Microsoft globally. We believe in the potential of AI to improve our lives in big and small ways. We need to make sure it's for the benefit of everyone. For the first time, we're having machines move into roles that have been the roles of human beings. Might these technologies have inadvertent effects on people and society? Do they align with people's values, their ethics? We needed to think through the implications for our company. 
Responsible AI is the approach that we take to developing and deploying our technology, making sure our principles are brought to life and that it empowers everyone and is inclusive and accessible for people. Papa. Excellent. The job of the Office of Responsible AI is to put our principles into practice by operationalizing ethics across the company. The Ether Committee is responsible for deliberating about hard new questions. We are sister organizations. Organizations. We have to think through what it means to detect bias, make our systems more fair, to detect errors and blind spots in our technologies, and on thinking through the kinds of advice we give to other organizations and to our leaders where technology can impose on privacy and human rights. Responsibility is at the core. We're learning every day about this new role of responsible computing. We need to translate academic thought to language that our engineers and salespeople are familiar with. Our customers are grappling with many of the same issues. It's incumbent on us to share what we learn. It's about trying to do better every day, working with our customers and outside agencies to develop processes and deliver responsible computing technologies to the world. I think we can all appreciate from that that really responsible AI is at the core of Microsoft when we talk about democratizing AI for everyone's use. Through a recently published white paper on AI uh, in Africa, we have identified five areas that we think we all need to abide by in ensuring that this truly becomes a responsible new era when we adopt this technology. And the first one is about building on government-led frameworks. Our governments already have enough legislation, you know, that has governed certain aspects. Like I said, AI is not a new technology per se. What we're talking about is the inflection point of all these different technologies that has gotten us to here. But to move with speed, we need to ensure that we do not reinvent the wheel. We need to build on the existing government frameworks to ensure that organizations can better govern, map, measure, and manage the risks associated with AI. The second one is about developing safety breaks for high-risk systems. That means that governments need to be able to identify what are the high-risk AI systems. Whether we're talking about you know, managing infrastructure that is related to electricity, or we're talking about military and so forth. How do we ensure that then we put the safety brakes to ensure that those systems will always be in human hands, you know, in making sure that they are governed better. But also it's about ensuring that we bring the sector into play to be able to share their knowledge on what system pose the highest risk to our organizations and also to, to, our, world, to, to our country. The third is about creating broad legal and regulatory framework. And this is about multi-tiering the different licensing systems. Like I said, when we're talking about high risk, but also making sure that we do not also classify everybody into one framework, but we can be able to tier you know, these different systems into, into the regulatory buckets. The last one, the fourth one, is about transparency around the AI systems. And we know there's always a balance to be you know, to be had between security and, trans uh, and transparency. But it is important that we govern that people should know how AI is used in the things that they interact every day. Whether it is a content that is created, how much of that content was created by AI. So that there is transparency when they use the technology and when they consume the products of that technology. And last one is also about ensuring that we pursue public-private partnerships in solving the societal problems. And Minister, you spoke lot about the partnership, so I will not go back to it. But suffice to say that uh, the Africans always say it takes a village to raise a child. It is our collective responsibility here to ensure that we craft this technology for the good of society at the foremost. And I can give you the commitment from Microsoft that that will always remain at the center of what we do. And I will not talk to all those commitments, but the two in the middle which is ensuring that we'll always put security first in everything that we develop related to AI. This is to give you the assurance that when you use AI, that you are safe and secure, and it only does what it is meant to do. And the second one that I just want to talk about, it is also about ensuring that we are committed to advancing responsible AI. And we will work with government. Uh, one of the things that we've done also in this
in this aspect of responsible AI to go beyond just the legislation and the legislators was working with the big global religions, the Islam, the Judaism, and the Christian religions to create a charter on responsible AI because we know that this technology touches all aspects of, of society. And then in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those that will be interested in reading that AI in Africa meeting the opportunity, you can scan the QR code and it will give you access to that publication. But my encouragement to all of you today is that let us not attempt this technology with hesitation because that will not help us. As the minister said when he came back from Geneva, he was a changed man. I hope when we all leave the summit, we will all be changed people and we will understand the immense opportunity that we have at our hands. Thank you and I wish you all the best with the summit. Great presentation, um, Patiwam. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I know we are feeling a little bit um, tired now. Um, I will ask for your indulgence for a few more minutes as we go into our last session before the break, which will be a panel discussion. Um, the panelists know themselves. I'm going to call up the moderator as well as the panelists to come on stage um, as we, we quickly move into this session. Before I do that, I just wanted to apologize to the community, the deaf, um, deaf community. Um, we hope that we can use um, AI to to um, produce reports that will that will enable them to hear what has happened here today. Thank you. Um, Nick uh, will then be uh, moderating the panel, and the panelists are uh, Mr. Alfred Mashishi, who is the coordinator of AISA, and he's the acting DDG for ICT International Affairs and Trade at DCDT. Please come on stage, and my co-pilot uh, on this journey that we've been on to bring the summit together, a great leader at the department. Um, can I also ask for the head of TUT AI Hub, Prof. Anush Kurin, to join us on stage. And then the head of the AI, the UJ AI Hub, Dr. Randall Carlson, another member of the community that we've been working quite well with um, as Microsoft as well in the past. Um, and then can I also ask for the head of CUT AI Hub, Prof. Alicia Marcus. Um, that does make up the, oh, and can I also ask for Janita Clarkson, who is our leader in the Digital um, Council of Africa. Um, she uh, heads up that organization where we are all uh, members. Thank you so much. Can someone please come take this off so that we can hand over to our panel? Thank you. Um, do, you want me to, do you want me to skip the questions? Because we can ask questions at the break. <laughs> Question after. spoke to Helen we're, we're going to try and we're not going to do the questions open questions we're going to take that into the break yeah. when Benison and Lady and Lamola and representing this country is actually accompanied by South Africa moving fast in being counted in staying a pace in as far as this uh, digital technology is concerned, where we make sure that we are inclusive, we leave no one behind. That finds expression in the number of houses we have connected since July until now, which is no less than three quarter of households. Yeah. Leadership, leadership, 
so important. And when it comes to ensuring that uh, regulation and policy is put in place, there definitely needs to be leadership around ensuring that the AI space is regulated, but also open enough to uh, enable creativity. The most critical thing, that's why I'm excited about this inaugural summit, is that it's a first of its kind. South Africa has got a lot of capabilities. The only thing is that they are not coordinated, they are not led. We go and look for those capabilities outside. Not long ago, Professor Marala said to me, the most critical things in the digital technology dispensation, he said, is computational capacity and data. And then data and computational capacity. Computational capacity is the ability to make effective use of data. Now, there are complex solutions that need particular computational capacities. He says we want to look for this capacity to deal with a particular problem, only to discover that it's here in Pretoria, in the CSIR. What does it say? You need this summit, where we have pulled all schools, universities, professors, private sector. We are going to, I'm going to appoint a council here, which is going to be inclusive of the private sector, public, civil society. That's on a day-to-day -day advise government on what initiatives are on the AI to make sure that there's a lot of readily available technologies to the poor. But if we do not connect, we don't know what those technologies are. If you listen to Microsoft, the, ish, the, the, the lot of technologies they have on AI which are, are readily available to be in the hands of poor people. We wouldn't know that if we don't sit like, like this and move the walls amongst ourselves. So that Remove the silos. The silos amongst ourselves and make sure that th that which is at our disposal is taken advantage of. Merely taking advantage of what is already here will take us lips moving forward. Yep. Minister, before I let you go very briefly, what do you hope was the ultimate outcome of this summit, aside from the public-private partnerships and leadership coming together? Uh, remember, we're, we're tabling here a draft policy on how we propose AI should be led in South Africa. We want to hear their voice and the process of critiquing it, panel beating it, and until we take it to the cabinet, and we want to make sure that we move together with DSI and other departments to make sure that when we talk to the public, department, the government is in one. Yeah. Thank you very much, Minister. We're Thank going to you. leave it there. I see that um, it is coming out, uh, so we're going to okay. let you go. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vanessa Langa, my camera colleague, is going to show you these last shots of RoboDog <laughs> as he's being uh, programmed um, uh, to, to um, showcase what he can and he cannot do. Um, and you can see here that this is really what the minister is talking about when he talks about private part, public partnerships and using innovation to try and ensure that uh, the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable in society are the ones that benefit from artificial intelligence, from technology, regulations and policies put in place by government. Studio.